Rock music used to be an insanely popular music genre. The most successful musicians on the planet were rock musicians. Hell, the phrase rock star is still synonymous with a person being great at something. The Beatles busted the doors wide open, while other acts like Pink Floyd, Elvis Presley, the Rolling Stones, and Led Zeppelin defined the genre in the 1970s. Then came bands like Aerosmith, Guns N' Roses, Def Leppard, Kiss, Rush, and other rock bands to shepherd the genre through the 80s. Nirvana, Green Day, The Offspring, Blink-182, and other punk, alternative, and grunge bands brought underground rock music to the mainstream in the 1990s. But then shortly after the turn of the century, rock music seemed to go out of fashion pretty quickly. By 2010, the rock music genre was mostly just a handful of bands like Foo Fighters, Fall Out Boy, Paramore, and a few other basically guitar-based bands keeping the music alive. And then by the time 2020 rolled around, it seemed that if you weren't already famous from being a rock musician in the late 90s or before, you pretty much had no chance of being a successful rock artist living off of your music. But it wasn't as if music stopped being popular. Not at all. Other genres of music still flourished during these times. Pop, hip hop, country music, all of it gained popularity and took over, where rock music basically slipped further and further behind. So why is it that rock music essentially died? And will it ever come back to the mainstream? Let's break it down together. It's natural to think that as society evolves, so do musical tastes. The rebellious, anti-establishment spirit, once synonymous with rock music, found new expressions in other genres like hip-hop and electronic music. Younger generations are drawn to sounds that resonate with their experiences and their identities, which may differ from what rock traditionally offered. Cultural diversification in the population in the United States and shifting sentiments for inclusion helped other genres such as hip-hop, electronic music, and even Latin music rise up and shift attention away from rock genres, which had pretty much become a predominantly white male music style by the year 2000. Even though that's not where the music started, rock music started, you know, back in the South, you know, black folks basically making rock music, especially jazz musicians, then turning to rock music or blues, you know, R&B artists turning to rock music. And then white people kind of took it and took it over. Hence the Beatles, right? Now, Statista, which is a site that kind of reports on the internet stuff, you know, streaming, you know, any sort of like statistical data, they reported that in 2020, the most popular genre for streaming was hip hop, followed by rock music, which is curious, then pop and country. This is pretty deceiving, though, because a large portion of these rock streams are of bands that were famous before streaming services ever even existed. New rock rarely appears on top selling or top streaming charts these days. Country music and dance, or kind of what's known as house music, surged in the 80s and 90s, and rock music kind of fractured into many subgenres. If you want to see a really cool timeline graph of what this looks like, check out the link below where there's a timeline broken down by Data is Beautiful that talks about the most popular music genres from 1910 all the way up to 2019. If you don't want to sit through the whole video, go ahead and put it on 2x speed and watch it. It's pretty incredible to see those genres kind of bouncing back and forth. Now, streaming also made it easier for music to get into the hands of young people. Instead of old rich dudes making choices on what was going to be popular, young people actually democratically or, you know, just by finding things on the Internet, were able to connect with artists who made sense to them, not just whatever some dude said was going to be famous. And that meant they were finding new genres that they typically hadn't even heard before. Another issue for mainstream music in general became the rise of YouTube, which essentially killed MTV's music video exclusivity and glory. Within just a few years of YouTube's formation in 2005, MTV shifted the majority of its programming from music-related content to reality TV shows. Tell me when was the last time you saw any real music stuff on MTV, unless you stayed up till like 2 a.m. or something when they put on like classic whatever this version, classic 90s you know, music videos or whatever. It seems ironic that the first music video on MTV was the Bungles video killed the radio star because the mass availability of music videos actually killed MTV. And since then, both radio and music videos have been relegated to streaming services instead of traditional terrestrial or satellite outlets. Now, rock musicians kind of have an ego problem. Sometimes it's that they want to be known, or sometimes it's that they don't want to be known. But these days, it seems like rock musicians, as a kind of 
majority tend to only care about how good they are at being musicians rather than how good or popular their songs are. You might be in a band where you say, okay, other bands really like us, but we're just not getting popular. If other bands are saying you're really good, it's usually because you are good, but you're not making popular enough music for other people to sit through and like it. There are many stories of bands refusing to take money or sign a deal because they didn't want to be called sellouts. The classic line goes something like, well, if my music's really great, I'll be loved. I'll make money. I'll be famous. One of the most famous instances that I'm aware of of a band rejecting money was when the Black Keys rejected 200,000 British pounds to license one of their songs for a mayonnaise ad in the UK as their manager said that they shouldn't take it for fear of being labeled sellouts. And this was way before the Black Keys were really famous. And they definitely had not seen that much money in one deal to that point, as far as I'm aware. They were even losing money during their tours at that time, which is crazy that they would turn down that much money just because they didn't want to be called sellouts. They already made the music. Somebody was just buying it from them to say that we want to put this in an ad. They're buying in. They're not having to create a mayonnaise ad jingle, right? They're not selling out to do that. They're just getting their song put into an ad. What's wrong with that? While rock musicians were shunning fame and fortune, their genre was being left behind, which essentially granted their wish of not being famous. However, in the meantime, the music industry was shifting towards artists who were happy to sign deals, make money from these guys, and become famous. It was very rare to see hip-hop artists complaining about their fame, for example. You know, Big Pimpin' might be a really good example of that. Jay-Z on a big yacht, lots of girls, you know, fancy cars and all that stuff. You know, if you're talking about fame, fortune, and, and glory and all that stuff, you're probably not too mad that, you know, you have to create a song that the producers or the record label might say you have to put out. A lot of these hip-hop artists were getting creative freedom because the record labels didn't even know what the hell was going to be popular because they didn't resonate with the audience. But they were willing to put money into it. As you might be aware of or not, most musicians do actually come from humble beginnings. But the attitude of rock musicians started to steer the genre in a direction that would be hard to reverse. Basically saying that we don't want to be famous anymore. We don't necessarily need the money. You absolutely need the money. If you want to keep playing music that you love, you got to take the money to make an income. You have to pay the bills somehow. Now, another big shift was the cult of personalities that rock music created started to quickly dwindle into self-loathing DIY artists. And I'm not talking about the indie artists that stopped really trying to be famous. I'm talking about the big you know, rock artists that basically said, we don't want to be known for being famous or we don't want the glory. We don't want the spotlight, all that kind of stuff. Right. Think about bands like, you know, Kurt Cobain from Nirvana. He didn't really want to be famous. You know, after that, it was kind of cool for everybody to say like, oh, we don't want to be famous. We don't want to be rich. We just want to make good music. Your wish was granted. Now, rock music has seen a big kind of struggle when it comes to changing. And I'm going to break down a few instances of what that really means here. First, I would talk about maybe their song creation, right? Rock music has been said to be very formulaic in its song creation, and that can lead to saturation of the market and boredom among fans. Think about it. If every rock act uses the same four to six chords and they typically sing within roughly the same range, you're not getting those, you know, like Justin Hawkins from The Darkness or Axl Rose really high and, you know, going low and, and having that huge range. Most rock acts don't have that. They just sing in the same kind of popular range. It becomes really hard to distinguish great acts from the crowd. Everybody just kind of starts sounding like each other. Also, while most pop acts do release albums, they also release every song on the album as a single, either on streaming or even sometimes on, you know, actual physical copies. Top rock artists kind of miss out on this because they usually only release one or two singles and then the full album, meaning most of their songs never get heard by a majority of the fans because most people don't buy albums these days. Of course, indie artists can't follow the same advice, and I'm only referring to top tier rock artists here. I'm not saying that indie artists should release all of their music on streaming. I've actually talked about how indie rock artists can still make music even without being rich and famous. And I'll link it to that video below as well. And the reality is that most artists who release their music as singles on streaming never really see much fame or fortune. So that's not what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about, you know, the everyday band, you know, the local bands. I'm talking about the top rock artists, right? The top rock artists would likely benefit from being more single focused and getting all the songs played over the course of, let's say, a year, as opposed to releasing them all at once. Another big issue is that rock musicians and fans historically tend to be, quote unquote, purists or gatekeepers. And that's a really big problem for the genre. 
anytime a new subgenre or a new hybrid of the genre appears or a new band that sounds like another band, think about Greta Van Fleet, for example. People shit on that band all the time. I have no problem with their music. They do sound like Led Zeppelin. Who gives a f***? Let them play their music, right? Fans and musicians alike tend to push these guys away. Those bands that sound like other bands are these new things that just, oh, we don't want that. We don't want to change. And we don't like when somebody sounds exactly the same. So they're basically saying they don't like it any way they want it. So if this gatekeeping or purism keeps going, yeah, rock's going to die and it will never be resurrected. And another thing I want to talk about is essentially the human attention span has all but evaporated in the past 20 years. It's actually scientifically been proven. And the problem with that is that rock music has elements of guitar solos and other solos that can have several songs that go over five minutes long. Is that a problem? Maybe. Not so much for the greatness of the song, but potentially for the popularity of the music, right? The vast majority of radio songs stay under three minutes. And when people listen to music, they tend to even skip songs before they're even over so that they can hear the next song. Tell me, when was the last time you sat in a room with you know, people under 25 and they sit through an entire album or sit through even just a full song? Before that song's over, they'll likely hit skip because they want to hear a chorus or a verse and that's it. And then they want to move on to the next song, right? Several rock genres have resisted making shorter songs to match the trends in human attention span. You got to know your audience. If you don't put out what the audiences want, the audience will stop listening. Now let's also talk about the live music experiences because between 1955 and 2005 or so, rock music had some of the best live shows and fan experiences the world had ever seen. And think about it, if you look at some of those old videos on YouTube or wherever, and you see these massive crowds of like 800,000, a million people, most of the time, those bands were rock bands, Metallica, Guns N' Roses, you know, Def Leppard, whatever. Some of those bands were putting, you know, 500,000 people in the seats in Russia, for example. It was crazy. You know, crowd sizes of even 80,000 or more were common for U.S. rock bands and even international tours of the biggest bands. Fans would sing along to all the words and enjoy being outside or in an arena full of fans who also enjoyed the artists. But then there was a change. Basically, there was a revival of dance clubs in the U.S. Many music experiences started to revolve around DJs playing pre-recorded music rather than a full live band. And this kind of makes sense, especially for the venue owner, but even more for everybody around. It makes sense for fans who want to hear popular music because all the DJs got to do is press a button instead of, you know, a band trying to learn a whole song for a cover song. For venue owners who only have to pay one person that has much less equipment and can kind of fit in a corner and then not have to worry about all the ego and the drama of a full band. And it also makes sense for the DJs who want to keep more of their own income instead of splitting it up with members of a band. The idea of club bangers became the new hot type of music because you can dance to it. This meant the words or the kind of the meanings of the songs weren't even that important. What was important was the beat. Can you dance to it? I constantly heard friends say things like, oh, I don't listen to those words. I don't know what that song's about. I just like the beat, which is very detrimental to rock musician fans because most of the time I listen to the song to know what the song is about. And like I said, the times, they changed. And just like jazz, ragtime, and polka basically disappeared and no one ever played them or heard them again, so too did rock start to see its own demise. So who's to blame for all of this? Why did rock and roll kind of die? Why hasn't it been new bands rising up like it used to be back in the 80s and 90s? Well, this all comes down to your own opinion. But in my opinion, the first blame would probably fall upon the famous rock musicians who basically rejected the fame. And then also the up and coming artists who vilified mainstream rock bands as sellouts. Why would you do that? If you want to make money at the craft that you love doing, keep supporting that, right? Make sure that this money machine keeps going. The gravy chain has to roll on, right? What are you doing? Why are you sitting there saying that these people shouldn't make money from their music? That's absolutely insane. Fans, well, you also have a share in the blame as well for refusing to accept new genres, declining support for local artists, which is probably the biggest way for new music to rise. Go to local shows, everybody. Go to local shows. Let me say it again. Go to local shows. Also, if you're not buying music from artists, you're not buying vinyl, you're not buying cassettes, whatever, you know, buying merch, all that stuff, help these people out. They need to make some money so that way they can keep doing what they want, right? Don't just refuse to pay for music. Don't sit on a Spotify and say, this is the only way I'm ever going to consume music. 
And the other part of this is that fans actually started rightfully looking for new music in other genres that were being more creative. Rock music wasn't being as creative. It was cutting edge for a long time. And then other industries and other genres started kind of leaving them behind. Now, the music industry is also to blame to some extent. But if you think about it this way, the dinosaurs of the music industry, they didn't willingly change their business model. If it was up to them, they would have just kept letting the good times roll, right? Keep putting the money in their pocket. They basically didn't want to change the popular genres of music. They knew what they had. They just wanted to rinse and repeat that cycle, right? The rich guys actually just decided to go where the money was, and thus a whole generation of rock musicians effectively got dumped all at once. You, boil, you put that all together in a pot and let it boil, and you basically have the death of rock and roll. So how does rock music actually make a comeback? Well, it starts again with fans. You need to support bands and artists who play actual rock music by showing up to shows buy their music, get their merch, and share their music with others who might like it. Fans who feel a strong enough connection to rock music should actually aspire to play instruments and create their own form of rock music. It doesn't have to sound exactly like stuff before, right? Don't be confined by you know, classic rock or grunge or punk genres. Be unique. You can transform the genre or even create your own genre. Musicians who do play need to start enjoying their performances. I don't know how many times I've seen rock bands play and look miserable for being up there. Not saying all of them, but there's too many, right? People look like the tortured artist. Be grateful, be happy. This is the attention that you want. You're putting yourself up there. Be grateful for it. You also need to start putting in 100% effort into every performance and don't be discouraged for a low turnout, right? If there's only three people there, three people more than maybe have heard your music before, be excited, get to play. You're still playing music. Even if you don't make any money that night, think about it this way. You don't make money when you practice in your garage or practice in your practice space, right? This is just a test. Let yourself be tested. Let yourself be immersed in the challenge of becoming a rock band. It's still great experience. Never forget that. Another thing that I think rock music tends to forget is that collaboration should not be out of the question. Remember when Paul McCartney did a track with Kanye West and there were these infamous tweets suggesting that Kanye was doing Paul McCartney a huge career favor by collaborating with him? Well, obviously not. He was a Beatle, right? So those people are just morons. However, imagine, just imagine if Kanye or somebody who was a famous rock or famous you know, pop hip-hop musician did put out a up-and-coming rising artist on their you know, song, right? Like your band or you being featured by a pretty well-known artist. That would be huge, right? It seems odd, but in fact, that's exactly how new pop and hip hop artists get their own fame. They get featured and then become stars. Literally go back through the timelines and see how many times Nicki Minaj or some of these other people were actually featured in, you know, hip hop, rap, you know, pop acts before they became their own mega stars in their own right. Famous rock musicians need to support and feature up and coming rock artists on their songs, albums, and especially their tours. Venues and festivals, you need to get your shit together. You need to start promoting the rising rock bands instead of hanging on to the past. I get it. 80-year-old dudes really want to see you know, bands from the 1980s you know, and 70s play this music. But there are a lot of bands that are coming up that still have a pretty big following, especially online, that if they can be put in front of a lot of people and start headlining or co-headlining tours, it's going to make a huge difference. And if you don't start changing your ways, when those old bands are dead or retired... The rock genre will basically have nothing left to sell to fans, and essentially, it's never coming back. So you put all that together, I think we can actually start to look at the fact that maybe rock music can actually have its heyday again, maybe it can start to rise to glory, and I'm encouraged every time I see a band under 30 or a band under 20 playing rock music, playing their own instruments, getting up making their own songs, you know, kind of changing the, the new wave sound of rock music. I'm always encouraged by this. So if you see these kinds of bands, go out there and watch them. Don't just think, oh, they're just some crappy local band. M most likely, they're probably better than some of the best bands you've actually listened to in the past. You're just not giving them a fair shot. That's all I got for you today. If you learned anything or liked what you heard on the show today, please show us some support and subscribe to this channel and like, comment, and share this video with a friend or put it out on social media. I hate to keep asking, but without those small actions, the YouTube bots basically ignore us. Putting these videos out is a lot of work, and if you want to show your appreciation, please consider purchasing some of our musical accessories or merch from our store at PoweredByRock.com. 
You can read our blog and follow us in the links below as well. That's our show for today. I'll see you soon for the next episode. Until then, rock on. Supposed to be